So now that you have created some space by ending some things, you've got, you got a place to actually move forward now. And we want to talk about flourishing forward. Mm-hmm. And I want to remind you of a poem that we gave you way back in course one. Do you remember the poem written by Ella Wilcox way back, she wrote it way back in 1916. But here's the poem. But to every mind there openeth a way and way and a way. And a high soul climbs the highway and the low soul gropes the low. And in between on the misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low, and every mind decideth the way his soul shall go. One ship sails east, another west, by the self same winds that blow. Tis the set of the sails and not the gales that tells the way we go. Like the winds of the sea are the waves of time as we journey along through life. Tis the set of the soul that determines the goal and not the calm or the strife. Well, that's a very insightful metaphor that there's much in our life that we don't control, but we can set our sail. And that's what we mean by flourishing forward is that you have a vision for where you want to go. You have a sense of nudging of God within you and you're going to obey. You're going to go there. And so there are many ways that you can take, but some ways that you go will be more helpful than others. And that means that you have to decide what's the most effective way to get there. Which moves in your life will be of maximum benefit to you. And not all choices are created equal, friends. In the second half, what we need to have is the wisdom to make the best of the few things that will produce the greatest results. We want this pruning to result in good fruit. In fact, some people refer to this as the 80-20 principle or the Pareto principle. This is a very interesting thing that uh, came across a number of years ago and written up in, in a book actually quite a while ago. But the Pareto principle says that life is not distributed evenly. There are some things that are more effective than others. There are some people and there are some time things you do and some activities that if you use them properly has more impact than other people and other times and other activities. So look, for example, and see if this isn't true, that if, you, if you're if you a business owner and you've got a number of employees, 20% of those workers probably do 80% of the work. And if you own a business, probably 20 of the customers create 80% of the revenue. 20% of the people in a crowd will make 80% of all the decisions. And here's a good one. 20% of the book is 80% of the value. You don't have to read every single word in a book to get the best out of it. But here's a really good one. 20% of your time produces 80% of your accomplishment. And if you're a pastor, 20% of your sermon, 80% of the impact. In fact, there's a saying, if you don't hit oil in 20 minutes, quit boring. (laughs) I've never forgotten that one. And if you're a pastor, you'll probably, well, maybe you don't know. If you're on the finance committee, you might know that 20% of the people in the congregation give 80% of the offering. And 20% of the people do 80% of the volunteering. Wow. This is, these are true. When we see these things, we, we know this, this actually is true. And the key for us to flourish forward is to identify and prioritize the top 20% in your life. What essential value or priority will you increase now that you have more time and space? Do you see that? You've created some, some margin. Well, now what are you going to fill that margin with that really will have maximum impact? What blue ocean thinking or practice will you create to maximize your impact? In the book, Blue Ocean Strategy, they call it value innovation. And I just love that term. Can't you picture it? There's a whole set of values. Your company or whatever have told you this is what matters. 
But then you take a couple of those values and you innovate with them. You imagine them. You, you, um, you maximize them. It's taking the value industry, uh, the value system of the industry and tweaking it, shifting it, changing it, either by rearranging the priority of the values or addressing completely new values that the industry hasn't considered before. This is when an organization or team sets out to innovate and create. And sometimes those innovations have a major impact and change the whole playing field. Others suddenly find themselves behind and trying to catch up. I wanna give you some examples. In the book, um, he uses Southwest Airlines as an example. It changed the value priority of the airline industry. So much so that others then realize that if they're gonna survive, they have to copy what Southwest Airlines is doing. They're the only ones making money. So we better find out what they're doing. Well, it's because they had value innovation as part of their mission. So here are some others. Uh, Starbucks. Starbucks changed the value system of a coffee shop. It was no longer just about the coffee. Yeah, the coffee matters. But now it's become a social space. Starbucks did that. And then everyone followed behind. Microsoft. The days when they had full rooms, a, a computer was in a, was in a huge room. The days when only, only uh, companies and businesses could afford a computer. Microsoft changed the value system and said, no, we want to make it personal. We want everyone to be able to have a personal computer in every room. Amazing. They changed, they changed not just the industry, actually. They changed the whole world with that one. So here's another example, personal example. Um, I'm part of a house church network. We started the Edge House Church Network with blue ocean on our minds. Here was the question, what priorities in church, in, in our typical experience of church, what priorities or what activities are producing 80% of the financial stress and distraction. Well, we decided that um, what those were, were buildings and programs and events. Those were producing 80% of the stress. And so we thought, let's eliminate those or at least reduce them. This freed up time and space and money to focus on the 20% that would produce the greatest results, the results we are hoping for in church. So we asked ourselves, what are, the, what are the activities, what do we do that produces the most results? And the conclusion we came to is small groups. The relationships that are formed in a small group, they produce most of what we hope for in church. So what if small groups was all we did? What if we increased that, raised it up? Well, then we thought, well, then we're kind of like house churches. So then house churches became our blue ocean. Now, you may not come to the same conclusions, but the process works. Ask yourself those questions. What 20% is producing 80% of the results we want? Focus, zero in on that. It's a basic but powerful principle that can lead to flourishing forward. So, Dan, give us, give us a couple more examples of that. Yeah, friends, this is a really important uh, principle. So this is why we're telling you a number of stories. Here's another one. How about Cirque du Soleil? The greatest competitor to this small startup company of acrobats was Barnum & Bailey Circus. And so Cirque du Soleil made some value choices that were opposite of Barnum and Bailey. They said, we will have no animals in our shows. And instead of having a tent and just moving around from place to place, we're going to put a large tent and we're going to stay in place for many months. We're going to be in major centers and stay there. And we're not going to have three rings in our circus. We're going to have one focus, one ring. Mm -hmm. Instead of just juggling tricks and clowns and little things going on, 
we're going to have a story and a theme that that ties it all together. And Cirque du Soleil decided we're going to take acrobats to a whole new level. And friends, you know what happened. Barnum and Bailey is gone. Cirque du Soleil all over the world. And it's because they deliberately chose to do things in a different way that gave them a blue ocean. Mm. And actually, let me give you an example again in, in my life, and that is of the Crest Leadership Program. When I started this, I decided, you know what, I, I'm in post-secondary uh, life development and in uh, diploma and degree, and I don't want to compete with traditional post-secondary institutions. So how could I do it differently? Well, we decided we're going to not have any buildings. Crest never owns a single building. We just use rented facilities somewhere else. Neither did we invest in a library where you have to come and actually check books out. We've said, you know what? Everything's available online these days. We're not even going to try to have a library because the world is practically a library. And who's going to be involved in teaching? It's not going to be you know, faculty or professors that have been doing this for decades. We're going to actually ask practitioners, people like John, who are actually actively leading things right now. We're going to talk to people who are actually doing what they're teaching. And instead of formal learning, which means that we get uh, we have to submit what we're doing to a controlling group and they have to be approved and the government, uh, you know, kind of watches over everything. We decided, no, let's just go with non-formal, which means the content is rigorous. It's thorough, but we're free to innovate. And instead of large classes, you don't think universities where they have two or 300 in a class, we decided, no, let's do it in small cohorts where we're highly relational. And that allows us to have less of an emphasis on lectures and a lot more on conversation. And our students, instead of you know, trying to compete and have more young students, let's look for a place where there hasn't been much help. And friends, it was people like you at midlife and second half. I looked around and realized all our education practically is for young and emerging leaders. Who is helping people like you? And so we focused on you and we ended up with Crest being this innovative difference. And we've enjoyed almost 20 years now of being able to operate in a blue ocean. It yeah. works, friends. You can think about this for your life as well. Yeah, and Dan, that's that's the key right there. That's why we're talking about this. Yes, to show you, um, in the in the business, the corporate world, how this works, but then to translate it for you. That's that's the key right here. Is translate that now into your life. Your life is the most important context for value innovation, and second half of life, you have this convergence of, of time and, and financial stability and, and maturity and experience, um, education. You have this convergence of these things that makes this time in life um, key for, for value innovation. Think about what your values are, and then let's maximize those. This is essentially your path to clarity and significance. Begin with necessary endings that will give you the time and space and energy and money to invest in the few things that are really you. And you being at your best is best for everyone around you. The people in your life benefit from you identifying and pr prioritizing the 20% that maximizes your life. If you're at your best, then everyone around you benefits. So how do you do that? Well, it's what we've been doing in the last five courses and this course as well. This is what you're doing with your four pillar plan. You're taking the areas of your life and, and, and prioritizing four pillars. And within those pillars, you're selecting a few activities that will make the biggest improvements in each of those pillars. So it's not 20 pillars with 100 things in each one. It's four with two or three in each one. 
then you can focus. These will be, um, these will lead to the greatest impact. It's also what you did when you evalu evaluated your trust levels. You identified the three core behaviors you want to improve that will make the most difference in how you build and extend trust. It's the thinking behind the misery rules, selecting the few adjustments that will produce the most relief of stress for you. It's not 30 things. It's a couple of things that will make a big difference. It's the thinking behind identifying your five top values and your five top strengths. It's, it's finding that 20%. This idea of excelling at a few things to have the greatest impact is the clarity we are all looking for. That's being clear when you know the few things all through your Crest experience. We've encouraged you to get clarity on the one, the three, the four, the five, right? What's the 20% that may produce 80% of the results you desire in your life? When you sort that out, well, then you found your blue ocean. That's very good, John. Another way of saying it in a succinct way is that life after 40, the issue is focus. Mm. Because you can do lots of things, you can go lots of directions, but what's the one or two things that will make all the difference? And that's a discerning journey that only you can take, only you can figure that out. So friends, that's why we give you assignments. We encourage you to not just rip through them, but to actually take time to think about them. Mm. You, they're intended to help you process these things well. And feel free to contact us for feedback. Um, John and other facilitators are ready to, to dialogue with you and, and let you have conversation directly. Remember, Slack's a good place to do it as well. Others can help you. You can contact other fellow students directly and just have good conversation with them. Talk about these things with some of your best friends back at home, where, wherever you are, and, and engage in a conversation that will just help you clarify and come to some good conclusions. Excellent. So, our next video, we want to try and help you fulfill purpose. It's another good one. Mm -hmm.